from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me to the 20th chapter of the book of John. The 20th chapter of the book of John, beginning with the 24th verse. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, you've believed. But blessed are they, blessed are they in 1977, blessed are they, that have not seen. They've not been able to touch my body. They've not been able to see the nail prints in my hand. They have not been able to see the place where I was pierced by the spear. But they believe anyway. There's a special blessing and a special reward for them because they have to come by sheer faith. You have seen and felt and touched as well as believed. That has a message for us, but I don't want to go into that whole dialogue because time is very short, and I don't want to be very long tonight. I want to take one little phrase out of that and use it tonight, the hands of Jesus. The 20th chapter and the 27th verse, Behold my hands. Behold my hands. Do you know how many times the word hands are used in the Bible, or the word hand is used in the Bible? 1,433 times. Now look at your hands. Take them out in front of you and look at them a moment. It's the most versatile part of all your body. We climb with our hands. We push with our hands. We pull with our hands. We throw with our hands. We catch with our hands. We can tear with our hands. We can thread with our hands. We can sew with our hands. We can chisel with our hands. We can sew with our hands. We can drive a nail with our hands. We can draw a picture on a canvas with our hands. We can play an instrument with our hands as we heard these men from Ireland a moment ago. We can even walk on our hands, as I've seen some do. And of all the five senses, the eagle can see better, the dog can smell better, and the horses can sense better and hear better with their ears. But none of the animals have the hands that are capable of such diversification as the human hands. Think of everyday usage that we make of hands. If you want assistance, you say, lend me a hand. If you want experience, you say, I'm an old hand at that. If you want to express a wasted life, you say, well, he's empty-handed. If you want somebody who's greatly involved, you say, well, he's got his hands full. He can't do it. And the wedding ceremony, at least most of the ceremonies I've gone to and certainly all that I've conducted, some point in the ceremony, I ask them to join their right hands. And then when the church offices are ordained in many denominations, what do we do? We place our hands on them, as they did in the Scriptures. Julie Eisenhower wrote a wonderful little book, not a little book, it's a big book, on interesting people. It's one of the most interesting books I've ever read. And one of the interesting people she wrote about was my wife. And they serialized uh, that chapter in a number of newspapers across the country. Maybe they did here, I don't know. 
but she has the most remarkable description of my wife's hands that I've ever read. And I thought, well, she's captured not only Ruth's life and her spiritual dimension, and you know, Julie was in our home for several days and she never took a note. She must have a tremendous memory because everything in that chapter is almost to perfection about my wife, a little bit about me. She, she got that straight too. <laughs> but in reading the four Gospels, they constitute a picture book of Jesus' hands. And I want you to see the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. First, the creating hand. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul in Colossians said, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created, visible and invisible. All the mountains, all the seas, all the stars, all the planets, all the galaxies were made by him. Those hands flung those galaxies into space from flaming fingertips. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus says in this chapter, Behold my hands. He also said it in Luke 24. Behold my hands. The hands that created the world the Lord Jesus Christ's hands. And then secondly, there's the healing hands. We've been talking about people in the city of Cincinnati in this area tonight hurting. People that are in the hospitals that are sick. People that are dying right this minute. People that have been told today that they have terminal cancer. People today. the dean of our college where we live, one of the most wonderful men I've ever known, fell out of a tree today. He's dead tonight. We don't know whether he had a heart attack or what happened yet, or whether he, he broke his back or his neck when he fell. One of our neighbors and one of our friends. Our hands, the healing hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he uses your hands as you minister, the hands of a doctor, the hands of a nurse, the hands of a social worker, the hands of the clergyman, the hands of the psychiatrist or the psychologist to talk to you, to heal you, to help you. But there's the hands of Jesus to heal your heart, to heal your mind, to heal your soul, to heal your body, if he wills. Think of the leper crying, unclean, unclean, unclean. The lepers, no one could go near them, social outcast. Little bells they would ring in those days. Keep away, keep away, I'm a leper. Unclean, unclean. Jesus walked right up to them and put his hand right on the leper. Can you imagine what that meant to that leper? I imagine years had gone by since a human hand had touched him and Jesus touched him. And he was healed. The leprosy was gone. The healing touch of the hand of Jesus. Remember when he went to Peter's home, Peter's mother-in-law was sick nigh unto death. Jesus went in and took her by the hand. She got up and began to wait on the tables. The healing touch of Jesus, the man born blind. Jesus calls him to get a little dust from the earth, collects the saliva and puts it in the dust and makes a little salve and puts it on his eyes with his hands. And he's healed. The touch of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in healing. Has he come into your heart to heal your hurt? The hurt between you and your wife? The hurt between you and your son? The hurt between you and your brother? The hurt between you and your neighbor? The hurt of poverty out of a job? The hurt of 
bad health, whatever it is, let Jesus touch you tonight. He loves you. He wants to help. But he can't help if you keep the door closed. You have to open the door. You see, he's standing there knocking with his hand, as we'll see in a moment. And then thirdly, we've been talking about earlier this evening, the hand of compassion. He said, I have compassion on the multitude because they've now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. So he said, feed them, the hungry people of the world. He has compassion on them. He has compassion on you tonight in your need, in your hurt, in your place, in your suffering. And as he looked out over the city of Jerusalem, he had compassion on that great and magnificent city. He knew that judgment was in store for the city, and it says that he had compassion on them. And he looks over Cincinnati tonight. He looks over Kentucky and Indiana and Ohio, these three great states, and he has compassion. And then fourthly, there's the hand of blessing. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took up the little children, and the scripture says he blessed them. I see little children here tonight. You may have gray hair and you may have a bald head, but in God's sight you're a little child. And Jesus wants to take you in his arms and love you and bless you and change you and make you a new person and make your home a new place and give you hope and purpose and meaning for life if you'll let him, but you have to open the door. But you have to become as a little child. You can't come to Jesus with your shoulders red back and with a lot of pride. You have to get rid of all that pride and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You died for me on the cross and I'm coming to that cross and I want your blessing. I want forgiveness of my sins. Has that happened to you? And then fourthly, there's the suffering hands of Jesus. And this is the thing we will be most impressed with when we see him in heaven because, you see, when we get to heaven, we're going to find that his hands suffered when they drove those nails in and then when they picked him up and hung him between heaven and earth and the terrible jolt that tore his hands and the wound was so great that Thomas could put his own hands in those holes. And Jesus will wear those scars for eternity. And when I look at the cross, I see at least three things. I see sin. The most sinful place in the history of the world is the cross. Jesus became the most sinful man that ever lived. You know why? The scripture says he became sin for us. He had never known sin. All of a sudden, he not only had the sins of the people of that generation, but he had the sins of all mankind, every person that will ever live. He had the sins on him. He became guilty of every single sin. Think of a person that had never sinned and all of a sudden every sin he's guilty of. His suffering was 10,000 times worse than that of the average man who would be crucified. He was suffering spiritually when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The suffering hands of Jesus, I see sin. But I also see something else on the cross. I see the love of God. I, I, can't, ex I can't describe it. There's no way to describe God's love. It's too deep, it's too high, it's too broad. It's too great. The New Testament writers had to invent a new word to describe the love of God. There was no word for love in the whole Greek language that could describe the supernatural love of God, so they invented agape. And if he bore our sins on the cross, then God can still be just and still be the justifier. 
Because if God had just come along and forgiven you without somebody paying the price, he would have been a liar and his moral universe would have blown up and exploded like an atomic bomb. Somebody had to pay the price. Either you or some sinless person that would be acceptable to God and that person was the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing I see in the suffering hands is that it's the only way of salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other except through the name of Jesus. You can't be saved by your works. You can't buy your way. It's not for sale. But Christ offers it to you from the cross. It was the blood that was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, the Scripture says. And he shed his blood on that cross for you. And it's the only way. The blood has to be there. Remember the night in Egypt in the Old Testament when the death angel passed over? And those Jewish people had to have the blood sprinkled on the doorpost in order to be saved? The blood had to be there. And so the blood has to be there for God to see, and he sees the blood of Christ that was shed for you. And he passes over when judgment comes. And then there's another thing about the hands of Jesus. What kind of hands? The healing hands, the suffering hands, the nail-scarred hands, but then his knocking hands. In Revelation 3.20, the Scripture says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Knocking at the door of the church. Knocking at the door of your family. Knocking at your door. Why doesn't he just push the door open and come in and save me? He never interferes with your will. You have a will of your own. That's the way he made you. He made you in his image. You can reject him. You can go to your grave rejecting Christ and there's nothing God can do about it. He'll do everything in his power to warn you. He'll do everything in his power to bring incidents across your path to stop you. But he won't trespass on your will. That's something you have to decide. You have to say, I will receive him as my Savior and my Lord. And so your will is involved. You have to invite him. If you don't invite him in, he won't come in. He'll not push the door open. What motivates a person to open the door? Well, I was talking to a person just before I came to Cincinnati about Jesus Christ. We met on the plane. He told me that he'd been converted a few months earlier. And I said, how were you converted? Well, he said, we had a, a child, our only child. She was killed in an automobile wreck. And he said, I knew that I'd been resisting God for a long time. And he said, as I stood there and watched that little casket go down into the grave. I said, Lord Jesus, come in. And you know, I began to realize that God had to take my little child to get me into the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I often wondered at the love of God. He said, even in my tears, I knew. What motivates you? A railroad engineer fell out of the train and it went across his leg and he lost his leg and he said, I was there cut in the darkness. Nobody knew I'd fallen. I lay there bleeding and I felt Jesus knocking at my heart's door and he said, I let him in. He's knocking at your heart's door. Can you hear him? And as you get older, you can barely hear it because your heart gets harder and harder and harder. He that hardens his heart, being often reproved, that means being often with knocking on your door, and you don't do anything about it. God will still speak, but you can't, you can't hear anymore. 
And the Bible teaches that there's a place beyond which you cross over a line. I'm not quite sure where it is and when it is, but it's there. And that's the reason he says, harden not your heart. Listen to the knock. And then sixthly, there's the outstretched hands of the Lord Jesus, stretching his hands for you and saying, Jim, Bill, Susie, Mary, I love you. I died for you. Come. Let me put my arm around you. Let me be your brother. Let me be your husband, your wife. Let me be all that you need in your soul and your heart and your mind. Because you see, it's not just to save you from sin and save you for eternity, but it's to save you right now, to walk with you. He'll free you tonight if you let him, those outstretched hands. Like the master violinist, he will touch you and bring beautiful music out of your life because he's the master and he's knocking on your heart's door tonight with those wonderful hands of his that created the universe. Will you open the door and let him in? You have to open. You may be a member of the church. You may be Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or you may not have any church affiliation. You may not have any religion. I don't know. Or you may be a deacon in the church. You may be singing in the choir. But you know Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. You want to make sure of your relationship to him tonight. You come. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, and come and stand here in front and say by coming, I want Christ into my heart. I want to open the door and let him in. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to all of you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. If you come from that top balcony, it takes nearly two minutes. So start right now, quickly. Many of you, hundreds of you, you come and let Christ come into your heart and make you a new person right now. Many people are already on the way. You get up and come with them. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision.
You that are watching by television can already see that hundreds of people are coming here in this beautiful Coliseum in Cincinnati. They're coming to receive Christ. They're opening their heart's door to let him in. You can do the same wherever you are. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. Open the door and let him in. Let his hand touch you. He'll forgive you and change you and make you a new person. God help you to make that decision and be sure and go to church on the Lord's Day. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. The love of God is greater power than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches Think the ocean fill, or were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore and Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to Job, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse. Job, the 14th chapter, and the 14th verse. Now, Job is in the Old Testament, and uh, it's the oldest book in the world. There is no known book in the world as old as the book of Job. And yet, Job asks a question that I'm sure disturbs many of you tonight. He asks a question that every great philosopher has wrestled with. He asks a question that every great thinker and intellectual at some time wrestles with. He asks the same question that one of the greatest scientists in this country asked me about three weeks ago. He said, science knows nothing about it, but he said, I'm disturbed about it and worried about it. Here is the question. If a man die, shall he live again? If a man die, shall he live again? The problem of death and life, or life and death. 
Haven't you ever thought about that? You've been to a funeral. For a few moments, you're solemn, you're thoughtful. That night, you go back, you go to bed, you think about it. One of these days, they're going to be taking me out to the cemetery. They'll be saying some words over me. Is that the end? Is it all over? Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. Birth is a happy event. Death is a tragic event. And we have tears. You take the fifth chapter of Genesis and you'll see the list of all those men that lived to be old men. Adam lived 930 years, but he died. Methuselah lived 969 years, but he died. I read about a man the other day in Brazil that they claim lived 134 years, but he died. At the end of every life is death. Life is very brief. The Bible says it's a tale that is told. It's a weaver's shuttle. It's a flower that fades. It's like the grass that withers. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow expressed it once when he said, Art is long and time is fleeting. And our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating. Funeral marches to the grave. And that's exactly where we're all headed. It is appointed unto man once to die. Thou shalt die and not live. Now the great question is, are you ready to meet God? Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. There is something after death according to this book. Now again, I say I can't take you to a scientific laboratory and prove it to you. But this book teaches from Genesis to Revelation that this life is only a preparation room for eternity. There is another life. The Old Testament teaches it. The New Testament teaches it. Jesus taught it. The apostles taught it. If a man dies, shall he live again? That's the question Job asked. That's the question that millions are asking tonight. And the answer from the Bible is a resounding yes. Yes. There is a life after death. If a man dies, shall he live again? Cicero, the great Roman, said, Upon this subject I entertain no more than conjecture. I've spent a great deal of my life searching for the answer. Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, in one of her columns a few years ago said, It's instinctive for man to believe in life after death. And it is. You never find a tribe anywhere in the world. You never find a culture. You never find a civilization anywhere in history that didn't believe in some form of life after death. And when the early forefathers and pilgrims came to this country, they thought they had found some tribes in New England that didn't believe, tribes of Indians that didn't believe in life after death, but they soon found when they communicated with them that they believed in the happy hunting ground. Yes, man instinctively, something down inside says there must be a future life. There must be something beyond this life. But after all, there's only one authoritative person that can speak on this subject. Because he came from the grave. He rose. And his name was Jesus Christ. About two or three years ago, I had the privilege of having an interview with, Con uh, with Chancellor Conrad Adenauer in his last year in office as Chancellor of Germany. He had invited me. I was preaching in Germany, and he had invited me to come and see him, and I didn't know what about. I was quite surprised and, of course, flattered to get the invitation. And I went. He greeted me, big, tall, giant of a man, the man that had almost single-handedly brought democracy back to Germany after the war. And I wondered, what does this great man want of me? The first question he asked me was this. He said, do you believe in life after death? I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I believe the Bible teaches it. He said, I do too. 
He said, I am studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said, when I leave office as chancellor, I intend to spend the rest of my life studying the resurrection of Christ because he said, if Christ is alive, there is hope in the world. He said, if Christ is not alive, there is no hope that I can see that civilization can be saved. Wasn't that something? Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, Where is Jesus? The angel said, He is not here. He is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire, that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior. And yet many of his followers and Christians live and act as though he's dead. He's not dead. He's alive. And the Bible says that at a given moment, a given signal, he's coming back to this earth to set up his kingdom. And what a kingdom it's going to be. It'll be a world in which there will be no tears and no sorrow and no death. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no war. There'll be no police forces. There'll be no armies. It's going to be a glorious world ruled by one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive. I've given my life not to a dead Christ, but to a living Christ. And I'm following a living Savior. And he's given me a song to sing. He's given me a flag to follow. He's given me something to believe. I have reason for existence. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going. Do you? God said, Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're going to die. Now, you and I are going to die because, you see, the Bible teaches that you and I have a body. But living inside of our body is the real you. You're a real person. And that's the part of you that lives forever. Your body is going to go to the grave. But you, the real you, your intelligence, your memory, your personality is going to live forever and ever. According to the Bible, you will never die. And you're going to spend a million years, a billion years, in one of two places, according to Jesus. Not according to Billy Graham, but according to Jesus. Jesus talked a great deal about heaven, but he talked three times more about hell than he did heaven. The other writers of the Bible don't have too much to say about hell, but Jesus talked about it all the time. In the Sermon on the Mount, I've had fellows say, I don't believe in hell, I live by the Sermon on the Mount. Well, you've never read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talked about it. Now, what did he mean by it? He said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be 
weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. What did he mean? Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What did he mean? He is saying that hell was never made for man. He is saying that God will never send anybody to hell. If man goes to hell, he goes by his own free choice. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for man. God never meant that a man should go there. And God has done everything within his power to keep you out. He even gave his son to die on that cross to keep you out. Because you see, when God made you, he made you a free moral agent. You can live any kind of life you want to. You can live a good life, you can live a bad life. You can break God's laws, you can obey them. You can shake your fist in God's face and there's nothing God can do. Because when he created you, he gave you a gift of free choice. You're not a robot that he push a, you push a button and you jump in a bag. You've got a right to resist God, to reject God. But the Bible says, in spite of our rebellion and rejection, God loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die for your sins. And when Christ died on that cross, we don't understand all that happened on that cross. But we know one thing, that he took the hell and the judgment that you deserved and I deserved because of our sins. He took it on that cross. And that's why that terrible expression comes from his lips, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you see, the very meaning of hell is separation from God. And in that terrible moment, a shadow passed between God the Father and God the Son for the first time since eternity began. Christ dying for you, and he suffered the pangs of hell. He became guilty of lying. He became guilty of slander. He became guilty of jealousy. He became guilty of the most filthy, dirty sins. And when those sins came into his soul, your sins and my sins came into his soul, God could not look because God cannot look upon iniquity. God is so holy. Christ took the hell that you and I deserved on that cross. Now God says, Receive him, believe in him, put your trust and your confidence in him and I will forgive your sins and I will guarantee you eternity in a place called heaven. It's all yours and it's all free. All you have to do is receive it. What an offer. He offers you tonight eternal life. Now, eternal life doesn't begin the moment you die. Now, when you die, as a Christian, eternal life doesn't begin there. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ. Now, many of you here in South Carolina and in North Carolina and all over the country have been reared in Christian homes. Or you go to a church. You live a fairly decent life. And you're sort of living on the reflected afterglow of your parents' religion. But you've never really received Christ for yourself. You've never really trusted him for yourself. You don't know him really. You're not really sure that you're ready to meet God. And the Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared? Are you sure you're prepared? You know, the Bible says these things I write unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I can stand here tonight without being egotistical, without being conceited. I can stand here tonight and say to you on the authority of this book, I know my sins are forgiven. I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I'm going to live as long as God lives because the moment I receive Christ, I became a partaker of God's own life. Now I'm going to live a billion years 
and I'll only have begun. I know that, not because of any goodness of my own. I'm not going to heaven because I've lived a good life. I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to great crowds of people. I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did on that cross. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not going to heaven because we're good. We're not going to heaven because we work. We're not going to heaven because we pay. We're going to heaven because of what he did on the cross, and all I have to do is receive it. And it's so simple to receive Christ that millions stumble over its very simplicity. You see, God made it so simple that children can believe. He made it so simple and so easy that a blind man, a deaf man, a dumb man can believe. A man of any race can believe. A man of any nationality, of any language can believe. And that's all God says you have to do to get to heaven. Just believe. Now, that word believe is a little more than maybe you think it is. It means commitment. It means surrender. It means that I give everything I have to Jesus Christ and trust him alone for my forgiveness and my salvation. It means that the moment you receive him, your name is written in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you prepared to meet God? If there's the slightest doubt in your heart tonight that you're prepared to meet God, don't you dare leave here without settling it. Why? Because you may never have another hour or another moment like this. You can't come to Christ any time you want to. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off that without remedy. Thousands of people have prayed for this crusade. The Spirit of God has brought you here. Hundreds of people have come to Christ already in this crusade. The way is prepared. Your heart is prepared. The Spirit of God is speaking tonight. This is the hour. This is the moment. And you may never have this moment quite like this again. I'm going to ask you to commit your life to Christ, to make sure that your name is written in the book of life, to make sure that you're going to heaven and to receive tonight eternal life. And here's the way we're going to do it. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now, hundreds of you, get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform right now, quietly and reverently. I'm going to ask that nobody leave the service, please. Get up out of your seat, men, women, young people. You may be members of the church. You may be an usher. You may be a choir member. Get up out of your seat and come and stand here. And after you've stood here, I'm going to say a word to you. Have a prayer. Give you some literature. You can go back and join your friends. That's all there is to it. But it's very important that you come and make this public declaration. Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. You get up and come right now. There's something about coming forward that settles it and seals it in your heart. You get up and come quickly. And I'm going to ask that everyone be in prayer. Bow your heads and pray. Pray for the person to the right of you and left of you and back of you and front of you. Perhaps no one ever prayed that they would come to Christ before. Many people are already on the way. You get up and join them and come. What an hour and what a moment for you to come to Christ. We're going to wait as you come. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance.
as hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. that have been watching by television and you'll be leaving the service now in just a moment you can make the same commitment and the same decision that these are making and the same Christ that will come into their hearts and give them assurance will do the same for you you may be sitting in a bar somewhere maybe you're in your living room at home or maybe you're in a friend's home Maybe you're in some unusual place that I couldn't even think of at the moment. And you need Christ and you need God in your life. You can receive him right now and he can bring about a tremendous change. And then go to church on Sunday. Have a talk with a minister. Tell him the decision that you've made. And get to work for Christ. And live in this brand new dimension of living. The spiritual dimension. Good night and God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We had to wait for.